working with uh, Cancer Research UK before, um, with Florian Markovitz and James Brent, and most of the work is kind of a combination of uh, the, the, these two uh, groups that I worked with over the last years. And I want to talk a little bit about um, copy number changes in, in cancer, um, talking a little bit more about the general patterns of evolution and um, looking at copy number changes on a more holistic level. So um, it's probably, don't need much to say that there is a lot of heterogeneity in cancer. Uh, we all know, know that by now. It exists on different levels, um, on the level of the individual patients, of course. You know, cancer is a very patient-specific disease. But then if you look inside those patients and you compare different metastases and the primary tumor and so on and the relapse, you will see that all these different um, met metastatic sites, the different samples, that they differ in their genetic makeup, copy number changes, point mutations, and so on. But even if you then take one of these individual samples and look inside them, there is a lot of heterogeneity on the genetic and tissue level uh, because every physical sample that you take is a, like a, a collection of uh, individual cells of tumor subclones and so on. So heterogeneity has been uh, of uh, great interest for a while now, and it was thought to be one of the main contributors to uh, resistance development in the clinic, um, something that has, of course, individual copy number changes have been identified with to have a beneficial or detrimental effect on patient survival, but we were more interested in looking at the, uh, the, the general large-scale evolutionary patterns that might, if, whether there might be a difference in, um, in uh, resistance development when looking at those. So uh, what we did was we conducted a clinical study uh, with the Edinburgh Hospital in Cambridge where we had a cohort of patients uh, that was sampled multiple times and we developed a, a new method for evolutionary reconstructions uh, of uh, copy number changes, um, evolutionary reconstruction of the tree based on copy number changes in the patient, which is called MEDIC. And all of you that are working with copy numbers, you um, would be very happy if you had a look at our big Bitbucket site and the according publication to try it out yourself. Um, the idea was to reconstruct the evolutionary histories of these, ca uh, these cancers in those patients and then, um, on one hand, uh, identify early driver events, something a bit similar to what uh, Andreas was talking about as well, look at the individual changes, but also, more importantly, look at the overall patterns of evolution and whether there was any correlation with uh, clinical endpoints such as patient survival and resistance development. Um, we performed this analysis on our um, OVO3 ovarian cancer uh, clinical study, and we came up with uh, this highly interesting result. The patients that we found in our study, we had about 20 patients, each of which was sampled something between 3 and 30 times, uh, 30 different metastases. So they were all physical, uh, s separate physical uh, samples taken from, from primary tumors and metastases. What we found was that our patients clustered into one of two groups. One group of patients showed this, what we called linear, kind of low heterogeneity, sort of uh, kind of caterpillar-like evolutionary uh, trajectories. Um, if you plot them in two dimensions, you see kind of a uniform spreading of the, of the individual cancer genomes, which are the black dots on this, what we call the evolutionary landscape. On the other hand, we found patients that uh, showed a very distinct branching pattern. So they were tightly c connected, tightly, uh, very closely evolutionary related subclades of the tree, uh, with a high support that um, were very different in their genetic makeup from other subclades in the tree. So there was branch evolution going on on one side and kind of a more linear sort of evolution going on on the other side. When we stratified our patients into these two groups, um, we saw that there was a significant difference and, and quite impressive difference in survival between these CE high, so high clonal expansion, high heterogeneity, branched evolution sort of patients on one hand, and on the other hand, between patients that showed a more linear, neutral form of, of um, evolutionary trajectories. This was just recently published in uh, Plus Medicine, if you're interested in the details. But this was um, all based on evolutionary changes, purely based on copy numbers. So we didn't really, I mean, we also performed sequencing, but we didn't really take the uh, point mutations into account when reconstructing these, uh, these trees. Now, I want to talk a little bit more about uh, our recent advances in the, in, this, in the copy number phylogeny area and what the particular challenges are. In general, reconstructing trees from copy numbers is quite easy. Um, typically, it's done with um, SNP, SNP arrays. We use the SNP6 arrays, Fmetrics. In our case, you can do it with sequencing as well. Take these different metastases. You get some sort of read counts or log intensities on the array. And in the end, what you want to get is a segmentation of copy numbers, meaning um, from your genome from left to right, a number of copies for each part, each segment, each locus on the genome. From those, these are kind of the input data for reconstructing evolutionary trees. And there are a few challenges you have to deal with such as that um, these uh, segments, the amplifications and deletions, 
They extend over a certain range. They can overlap. They induce horizontal dependencies. It's a process that's computationally quite challenging. That's what MEDIC, our software, is for. It computes what we call a minimum event distance. So the minimum number of amplifications and deletions that you need to transform one genome into another. That has proven to be a quite successful method for comparing these, uh, these copy number profiles. Now, the copy number profiles themselves aren't that simple. Because we use SNP arrays, and the same is true for sequencing as well, we don't, and the human genome is deployed. We don't just get only one total copy number state per genomic segment. We get what is called allele specific copy numbers. So typically the readout looks like this. You have a log R, which you can think of as the total DNA content, and then you have the beta allele frequency down here, which is the ratio of the two SNPs at each, each um, genomic location. So in the deployed normal section, indicated here by the, by the two at the first, uh, first part of the plot, you have uh, three options. You can have a homozygous SNP that is present, which has a, a SNP ratio a frequency of one. You can it's homozygous missing, kind of, it's not there. You have a, a frequency of zero, or it's a heterozygous SNP, and so you have it, uh, it's present in one allele, it's not present on the other, which leads to a 50% uh, ratio here. So instead of just getting the, the, the total copy number, what you actually get is the major and the minor copy number for each genomic, the genomic segment. That's typically referred to as allele-specific copy numbers, but the problem here is that the phasing is unknown. What that means is that for each segment, and technically even for each probe, while we know that one of the two copies, say, must be two and the other copy must be one, we don't know which physical parental allele the copy number state two or the copy number state one is assigned to. And this can change at each segment, technically even at each position. Um, and sorting out the, the physical assignment of those copy numbers to the parental alleles, parental alleles is called a phasing. And that's something that's really important for reconstructing accurate um, tumor ev evolutionary trees in cancer, um, as we will see on the next few slides. I brought you a little example here, which is from our ovarian cancer data set. So here we have uh, two samples taken from the same patient uh, with two metastases, and this is part of chromosome uh, 11, if I remember correctly. On the top, you have the log R total DNA content. Here's the biallelic frequency we colored, uh, the buff bands that are greater than 0 0.5 in dark, and the other ones in bright blue, and the homozygous probes are, are grayed out. Just by doing a little bit what uh, Florian would call by eye informatics, uh, so uh, just looking at these, these plots very, very, for a very long time, you can see breakpoints. Um, where at the beginning here is a deployed segment that was amplified over a long stretch. Here is a, co is a copy number three. You see the total DNA content going up. And um, you would say that the major copy number is two here, the minor is one, because the typical 50% buff band has now been um, increased to either 66% or lowered to uh, 33%. There's a deletion here as well. In the second sample, you see a very similar story, that there is this large-scale amplification, but in addition, there seems to have been another amplification, sort of overlapping the first, that increased the total copy number from two, three, to three, and four here. So now you can make an argument for some sort of evolutionary connection between the three, where you say, starting from a deployed, what probably happened was an amplification, a large amplification on a segment that gave rise to sample one, and then another amplification on the first part, overlapping the, the large amplification, which then in the end gave rise to sample two. So now, if you think about what actually happens when you amplify a physical allele, and here is a little toy example. Again, these are the physical alleles now, so the actual parental physical copies of the DNA. Some of the uh, SNPs will be present, other will be not present uh, in a homozygous way. Then there are the heterozygous SNPs, which we will, can only read as a 50% band. If physical allele A gets amplified, all the ones that are actually on the first allele will rise to 66%, and the other ones that are on physical allele B will rise to a relative 33%, leading to this pattern of, um, of, of buff bands, of buff frequencies. The homozygous ones stay where they are. But if the amplification indeed happened on the other allele, you will see a pattern that is exactly inverted to the one before, because now the, the SNPs that are on the second allele were the ones that get raised to 66% and the, the other way around. So we thought, okay, people so far have done segmentation and phasing for individual samples, but because we know that all these samples are evolutionary related, so they come from the same somatic cell originally, they share a common genetic background, by just fixing the, uh, the BAF assignment on one allele, uh, sorry, on one sample, and transferring that to the second, we might be able to identify whether the amplification or deletion actually happened on the same physical allele or on a different one. That's what you see in this plot. Same plot as you've seen before. The difference is now on the first sample, 
again, we mark the uh, buff frequencies more than 50% with dark blue and the other ones with bright blue. But here we keep the pattern. So we use the same coloring as in the one before, but plot the second data. And you can see this inverted pattern, how all, this, all the buff probes here that are, all the SNP probes that are here at 66%, dark blue, now are at 33% here. Doing a bit more by eye informatics, we just put in the breakpoints again. So what we actually know now is that it is not what we thought originally, that there was a large uh, segmental duplication here on the one allele, which is the same one that we see down here. No, we know now from the buff frequencies and this inverted pattern that actually the amplification has happened on the second allele. So we would call this, instead of calling it just the major copy number two and the minor one, we know this is actually a one two relative to the reference. So these were completely evolutionarily independent events that happened on those two uh, samples, meaning that the evolutionary relationship bet between them is um, more of a branching type of evolution, as we've just seen on one of the first slides, distinguishing between linear and branching evolution apparently makes a difference for survival, at least in ovarian cancer for our patients. So phasing matters, and it is important that we assign these copy numbers, the allele-specific copy numbers, major and minor, to the two physical alleles. Now, we can do that for every probe and every segment on our genomes, given that we have multiple samples per patient. But um, in the end, all we do is phase them relative to a reference. Now, how do we phase that reference is then the question. How has phasing been done so far? Well, in our software MEDIC, um, which computes these evolutionary trees, it already has a phasing algorithm in there. So MEDIC, again, I said it at the beginning, computes the minimum event distance between copy number profiles. So the minimum number of amplifications and deletions that you need to transform one profile into another. Now, this is kind of a parsimony or minimum evolution inspired idea, even though it is, we create a distance matrix and then use neighbor joining to get a tree. In the end, what we're looking for is the tree that minimizes tree length, so that explains our data with the smallest number of um, rearrangement events possible. We use the same criterion originally to phase the copy numbers. So we choose a phasing which in total minimizes evolutionary distance. Um, this works, and we've done simulation studies that show that it's actually quite good, but unfortunately, it's a very difficult problem and computationally very expensive, which means our genomes have to be compressed down before, and you lose quite some information with small focal deletions or amplifications before uh, being able to do that. Now, with this new approach of um, exploiting the, uh, the common genetic background and the buff frequencies on the, uh, on the arrays, you can do the same with sequencing, actually. Um, all we need to do is face this one reference allele. I'm going to point out real quick how that works. I don't have the, probably the time to go into very much detail. But the idea is that, again, we have two samples here, which here are labeled one and five for whatever reason. But um, we have a major and a minor, and we need to assign them to the two physical alleles. Now, this is two to the n, where n being the sequence length, possible choices of, of flipping or phasing for each position, which is um, too large to uh, enumerate exhaustively. So we use a context-free grammar to model um, the possible choice of phasing um, where we build up a, here's the grammar, so at each position we have a, a either you can, t you can use the two and the one, or you can say we have a one and a two. Next position you can choose the one and a, and a zero or the zero and a one. So this is kind of the grammar that, that describes all possible choices of this flipping or phasing. And then in the end we use um, a shortest path algorithm between two samples to uh, choose out of these different options the parse tree that minimizes the evolutionary distance between the samples. This before had to be done all against all and all the samples of the patient. Computationally expensive, takes a long time. Now all we need to do is choose a reference, choose it wisely, and then face that reference to, for example, a diploid normal, which could be artificial or taken from the data, and uh, to fix our reference phasing and then uh, do the other phasing in, in return. So we, what we can do in the end is then reconstruct these evolutionary trees with a probe level resolution, which was not possible before. This is the final overview of MEDIC then in all its three steps. Again, this is the URL if you want to try it out. A method has been published. It is, um, consists of uh, three steps. The first one is the phasing, which is now the combination of the phasing algorithm I just pointed out together with this context-free grammar evolutionary phasing. Once the, once the copy numbers are phased and we know which physical allele they are assigned to, we can compute a distance matrix. Again, that's just a standard distance matrix based on the minimum number of amplifications and deletions. We use neighbor joining to get the tree and then can perform ancestral reconstruction as well. Um, which uh, we can do because we know that cancer trees are rooted. 
you know, they all come from the somatic cell from the diploid normal. And um, uh, yeah, this together kind of concludes the reconstruction process. This is the underlying method that we use for the clinical study that I talked about in the very, um, uh, very first slide as well. Right, with that I want to uh, close and um, I'll just sum it up one more time. We were interested in large-scale evolutionary patterns to understand the etiology of intertumor heterogeneity. Um, we, what we also did, which I'm, what I'm not talking about here, but you can refer to the papers, is of course by doing the ancestral reconstruction across multiple patients, you come back to the last common ancestor of all cancer samples. So you can look at the frequency of individual um, amplification and deletion events, it's just something I haven't shown here. But uh, we were interested in the more large-scale evolutionary patterns. Phasing is important to reconstruct accurate evolutionary trees. We have now a new algorithm which we are currently implementing into MEDIC and there should be a new release very soon that allows a faster um, re evolutionary reconstruction with a new phasing algorithm. And um, with that I want to close. Thank everyone who is um, involved in the project, particularly uh, my boss Nick Goldman, uh, Peter Van Lu, who is uh, the author of ASCAD, the segmentation algorithm that I'm um, working on this project with at the moment. Uh, Florian Markowitz, of course, uh, my uh, previous supervisor, and uh, Saurabh Shah from the UBC is always very helpful with comments and, and um, advice. And you for listening. Thank you. So thanks, Roland. So just a question about the tree building. Have you started to think about how you could infer branch lengths and get at mutation rates and sort of how divergent these different clones mm. are from each other? Yeah, so at the moment we infer branch lengths by, um, so from the, from the distance matrix we use neighbor joining to get the tree. Then we do ancestral reconstruction that ultimately fixes the branch lengths because the branch lengths then are the number of events that have happened between an ancestral genome and the leaf node or the next ancestor. Um, but this is kind of the sort of parsimony inspired, you know, kind of a branch length criterion. We, ideally, it would be great to be able to uh, use a more probabilistic model that you could parameterize by time, just as is done in traditional phylogenetics analyses, you know, with the Markov process that is with, with the kind of amplification and deletion rates and the time parameter as well. Um, because of the horizontal dependencies, this is quite difficult computationally, but it's definitely something we're looking at, yeah. Also joining that together with mutational data would be, would be fantastic. Have you determined uh, what range of uh, copy number values you can tolerate? What's, do you have an upper bound? Can you, sorry, can you repeat the question? Do, do you have an upper range of copy number values that you can compute? Is there, what, to what? What maximum value can you deal with? I'm still not sure I got it. There's a lot of echo up here. <laughs> Have you calculated what upper range you can tolerate in your computation? Oh, the, the, the range of copy numbers that yeah. we can deal with? Oh, sorry, yeah. Um, so originally when we released it, we had um, kind of eight copy number states altogether, zero to eight, so nine states, um, maximum copy number eight that we, we worked with. But we have just done a new release uh, with some optimized algorithms, which is on the development branch of the software that deals with up to 15 parallel, so I think, or 12, I think so it's 24 copy number states altogether, which is typically way beyond the dynamic range of SNP arrays anyway. So people call very high amplifications from SNP arrays or sequencing. Um, I wouldn't necessarily trust whether there is a focal amplification with copy number eight or 10 or 12 or something, or we can probably say it's really large. Um, but yes, we have, we have increased the, the total number of so the different copy number states that we can deal with uh, lately, yeah. Thanks. All right, uh, let's uh, thank the speaker again. Cool.